friends, Jerome Powell, Jordan the Lion. Don't be alarmed, I'm not keeping my hair like this. This is not a flock of seagulls vlog or anything like that. I just woke up and I decided to start the vlog pretty early because I woke up and my grandpa said, here's what you're doing for your vlog today. And I started laughing and I said, sounds good to me. Because I told you guys on Christmas Day when we were driving that I came up with an idea based on something my grandpa said, and this is actually where it came from. I told him that one of you actually had commented on one of my videos and said that you were from Phillipsburg. And I mentioned that to him, he said, oh yeah, that's not too far away from here, that's, you know, that's within a drive. And I said, okay, just out of curiosity, and he said, you know, there used to be a really famous pitcher back in the 1920s. <laughs> who was from Phillipsburg, and I said, oh really? He said, yeah, he was one of the only pitchers to beat the Yankees in the World Series, and I said, no kidding. So I started looking into it, and this guy's story got really fascinating, so that's part of what we're gonna vlog today, and I'm gonna go hang out at my sister's house for a little while, and then my grandpa is actually gonna take me over to vlog something else in the area that is actually tied into what the vlog was yesterday. So days with Jordan the Lion, and his grandpa, and his puppy jaw, begins now. Today is gonna be fun. I'm pretty excited. It's not too often that I ever get to go out vlogging with my grandpa, obviously, and to get to spend a day seeing somebody that he actually remembers, and then something else that's historically just amazing, I can't wait. This is gonna be fun. The temperature dropped, so it's a little bit icier. He's had enough. My grandpa was doing a little bit of the homework for me, so that's our first stop of the day. Well, my grandpa was telling me a story about a man who was once the auditor out here in Montgomery County, and he had a pretty interesting story of his life even before that. So we're gonna go visit his grave right now in the town that he grew up in. So the focus of our vlog today is actually an old pitcher for the St. Louis Cardinals, who's now a member of the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame as well as the Major League Baseball Hall of Fame named Jesse Haynes. And he grew up in Phillipsburg. So when my grandpa and I were talking about Phillipsburg, he said, you know, there was a man named Jesse Haynes that was 20 game winning pitcher and I started looking it up and boy does he have a history. So that's who we're actually gonna go and visit today. And there's a sign that says, Welcome to Clay Township. And here's our destination for today. Can't believe my whole life, as much baseball talk as my grandpa and I have had, that I had never heard this story. There it is. Well, I think this would be a perfect place to start. This is actually Elias Haynes, the father of Jesse Haynes, who we're here to vlog. And his dad was actually the local auctioneer. Now, the reason I started here is because the first part I read about Jesse Haynes' story was that Jesse Haynes loved baseball, but his parents didn't particularly want him to play, so he would actually hide his, his Phillipsburg baseball uniform out in a corn crib. He would sneak out there, change into it, and then he would go play baseball and eventually move to Dayton and start playing minor league ball. Now most of you know me pretty well, and you know me well enough to know that I do not like the St. Louis Cardinals. Absolutely not. They've knocked my Cincinnati Reds out of so many playoffs, so many games we've lost to the Cardinals since I've been alive. I normally would never do anything associated with the Cardinals, but Jesse Haynes actually made his debut for the Cincinnati Reds. He played one game for the Reds in 1918, was sent back to the minor leagues, and then was, well, I'll tell you the story. Let's go over here to Jesse's grave. Now it is freezing out here, but I really wanted to do this one. Now here's the story. Jesse Haynes, here are some of the notable facts about Jesse is that Jesse actually was signed in 1920 by a man named Branch Rickey. Branch Rickey was the man who eventually signed Jackie Robinson, and Jackie Robinson made his debut as the first African-American baseball player. Now, Branch Rickey was actually working for the St. Louis Cardinals at the time, and the Cardinals didn't actually have the money to buy Jesse's contract, so he went to the investors of the St. Louis Cardinals and borrowed $10,000 in 1920 and signed Jesse Haynes, and Jesse made his debut and would go on to pitch for the St. Louis Cardinals from 1920 to 1937. Now, what I thought was so interesting about this guy was 
First off, he was the very first pitcher in Cardinals history to throw a no-hitter. Isn't that incredible? He threw a no-hitter, and it wasn't until 50 years later that the St. Louis Cardinals would have another pitcher that would match that. Now, Jesse also was the man who held all of the St. Louis Cardinals pitching records, and I mean all of them, until Bob Gibson came around. So now Jesse is the second in line for all those wins and games played and everything. But Jesse's got a great story also because he actually pitched in five World Series, winning three of them. Now the story my grandpa said was he said in 1926, Jesse was pitching against the New York Yankees, the famed Yankees that the next year would be known as maybe the best baseball team of all time. And he actually won two of those games. <laughs> he won two of those games against the Yankees. They didn't win the series, but not only did he win a game, by pitching a two to nothing shutout, but he also hit a home run in that game. Now this is a pretty interesting little piece on top. And when I looked at it, the first thing I thought was how cool. But there's actually a story to this, because see, Jesse pitched all the way up till 1937. He was a starter for a bulk of those years, and then I believe it was 1932 that they decided that he just didn't have it anymore, and they were going to make him a relief pitcher, and he still wanted to pitch, so he developed the knuckleball. He had somebody teach him how to pitch a knuckleball, and as opposed to most players that throw it with their fingertips, he actually would literally put it on his knuckles and throw it as hard as he could from the knuckles. And they said that off, off the mound, he was a nice guy, but they, they nicknamed him the Raging Bull on the Mound. And he actually, <laughs> crazy enough, this guy, when he retired from baseball in 1937, and he actually pitched for the Gas House Gang, they nicknamed him Pops because he was the old man on the roster. And uh, when, when the injuries would actually take hold of the team, this reliever would go back to being a starting pitcher for a short time. Then in 1937, he retired. The Brooklyn Dodgers hired him in 1938 to be a coach. And then this is where the story got really even more interesting is that my grandpa told me, and I looked it up and he sure was right. After 1938, when Jesse was done being a coach for the Brooklyn Dodgers, he came back here and he became the auditor of Montgomery County and he did that for 28 years. My grandpa said he used to run into him and he said he was always well dressed in a suit and everything. And the story behind this piece on top was that you might think, hey, what an elaborate headstone, but it's actually, this was, this was Jesse's retirement gift from the St. Louis Cardinals. They had made him this sundial, and it was his wish that when he died, this be paid, made part of his monument. Isn't that great? All those records that he'd hold. Most strikeouts, most wins until Bob Gibson came along. First no-hitter, hit a home run in a winning game against the 1926 Yankees. He would even play against Connie Max, um, Philadelphia A's. The first time that they met up, they actually lost. But the next season, they came back, and like I said, Jesse Haynes would lead his St. Louis Cardinals to five World Series appearances and three winning appearances. I mean, three championships. It's a pretty fascinating history right here in Phillipsburg. A lot of people may not know it. He actually was up for the 12 years of um, eligibility for the Baseball Hall of Fame and didn't get in, but the Veterans Committee actually thought he was so worthy that they voted him in. He passed away in 1978, and I believe he was voted in in 1970, so he was alive to see it. And then in 2014, the St. Louis Cardinals added them to the St. Louis Cardinals Hall of Fame. So, very distinguished honor for Mr. Jesse Pop Haynes. And the actual reason this was brought up between me and my grandpa was not only did I mention Phillipsburg, but he said that Jesse Haynes' granddaughter, or great-granddaughter, lives pretty close to my grandpa and he my grandpa said he's known different members of the family his whole life and said he's had pretty in-depth conversations with her about this so thought that was pretty cool 
the great Jesse Haynes started out as a farm boy here in Clayton and Phillipsburg and went on to be acknowledged as one of the greatest pitchers in baseball history and up until a day or two ago I had never even heard of him. That's what grandparents are for. Jesse actually pitched to the ripe old age of 43 and when he retired he had an ERA of 3.64 but when he pitched against the Yankees in 1926 he had a 1.2 ERA. Not bad against Lou Gehrig and Babe Ruth, wouldn't you say? Now one of the funny stories that my grandpa told me was he said, <laughs> he said 1926 when he was pitching one of those games, he had to be removed from the game. And when I read up, I found out the reason was because Jesse had developed a bleeding blister on his finger. With the bases loaded, they had to bring in one of the greatest of all times also, Grover Cleveland Alexander. And as my grandpa said, he was sitting back in the bullpen getting drunk, had no idea he would ever be in the game. They brought him in, he struck out Tony Lazari, and they won the game. How about that? <laughs> now my grandpa actually said that I had never seen it, but he said, haven't you ever seen the movie on Grover Cleveland Alexander? I said, no, he said, oh, Ronald Reagan plays him. You'll have to watch it sometime. But. Great addition to the story, I thought. And as my grandpa reminded me, he said, you remember what they called the that famous Babe Ruth, Tony Lazari, Bill Dickey, and Lou Gehrig lineup, don't you? I said, Murderer's Row. So I thought, I should include that. He beat Murderer's Row. This is where Jesse was born. My grandpa thought it'd be nice for us to take a little ride through the little town. There's the Grace Bible Church. You know, I was reminded as my grandpa and I were talking, I said, you know, it's kind of strange to think that Jesse Haynes would have been an auditor out here, but then I was thinking, I've seen enough baseball documentaries where back then those guys didn't make much money and they all had to have a job after baseball and almost always a job during the off season of baseball as well. We just saw this bridge up here, so we thought, might be a nice little experience to drive through it. Hilariously, my grandpa said, it's not private property, is it? I said, when has that ever bothered you? It is private. Yeah, well. We'll back out. Yeah, <laughs> there you go, guys. You can see their little creek there. I feel like I'm in Funny Farm right now when they're the movers are trying to get the red bud and they're backing out of that bridge that that starts falling down. Now we're going through Inglewood. And I used to actually spend quite a bit of time down here when I lived here. But we're actually uh, we're heading to my sister's house and then my grandpa had a great idea. He said, would you like to go see the old Wright Brothers house? And I said, I absolutely would. So that's gonna be the second part of this vlog. My grandpa and I were kind of reminiscing about how I used to come down here a lot with him and with my dad when I was a kid. And now if you, if you look, so much of it's just the houses are in disrepair, they're boarded up, they're just, the whole area is just in bad shape now. I'd say about half the houses that we've driven past have all been boarded up or had posted signs on it or just just in bad shape there you can see that's boarded up that's boarded up main and monument and the big beautiful house is just destroyed check out that Dayton mural now we're literally heading into downtown Dayton and there's the statue in the middle of Dayton, the monument. There's the Victoria Theater. My aunt has taken me to a, a show or two there when I was younger. That's a very historic theater down here in Dayton. There you can see the Dayton Holiday and this Christmas is the, tapestry. Uh, Schuster Building. Oh, Schuster Pavilion? Yeah on the courthouse right here on the right. Who's that statue of? 
Schuster? No, I, I tell you the truth, I don't remember who that is. And that's where Jesse Haynes had his office in there. Oh, really? Yep. Yep. Old Montgomery County Courthouse. Oh, look at that. Now we're kind of to the newer, nicer section of Dayton. This is kind of the area where the Wright Brothers' house is going to be. Well, we made it to Tara's house. Well, here's my sister's beautiful house. And the day that I came in, I said, Tara, did you get the postcard I sent you from, from uh, Belgium? She said, no. And then the mail came and she got it. So there it is. You guys probably remember that. Michelangelo. And there's a picture of Tara and Brandy together. She's always been a good person. She finally found somebody that treats her great, so I'm really happy about that. Are you playing with Tucker? Their new cat. They, they tend to get along and they'll play, but when I was down here a little bit ago making my coffee over here, I heard a screech and I don't know which one it was upstairs running around. So I'm over here hanging out at my sister's house and uh, I was just doing a little bit of research for where we're going next. And this is actually, that's gonna be pretty cool. This is actually a house here in Dayton called Hawthorne Hill. And this used to be 17 acres. Now I think it's like three acres. Um, but this was property that the Wrights owned um, post 1914. So this was actually a house that uh, Orville and Wilbur had built and they were going to live there together. And uh, Unfortunately, Wilbur died in 1912, so by the time they finished it in 1914, he obviously wasn't around to live in it. So um, Orville, his sister Catherine, and I believe their father Milton all lived in this house. And a lot of the electrical structuring, like a lot of the piping and some of the water pumps and stuff were actually designed by Orville Wright himself. So we're gonna head out there here in a little bit and we'll show you the grounds. Well, this is it. You can see today there's some kids out here sledding up and down the front lawn, but this is Hawthorne Hill. Now, if you look around, you can see the reason they named this, like I said, it's on three acres now, but it was originally 17. The reason they called it Hawthorne Hill was because there were originally 150 Hawthorne trees on this property. Now, Orville lived here pretty much until his death in 1948. And then the Wright family sold the house to the famous Dayton Catch, it's actually called the National Cast Register Company, but it's one of the more famous things in Dayton. They call it the uh, NCR. But when Orville lived here, he actually used to invite a lot of aviation dignitaries and heavyweights in the aviation field to stay here. And what's weird is that when the family sold the property to the National Catch Register Company in 1948, they actually sent a photographer here to document the entire inside exactly the way it was when the Wright family lived here. And then they proceeded to redecorate the whole inside. Everything except for Orville study. Orville study, to my knowledge, was never changed. And so the National Cash Register Company actually, for quite a while, actually used this for a guest house to dignitaries and people in the business of dealing with the National Cash Register, as well as, I guess, having like Christmas parties and stuff like that here. But on Orville's 135th birthday, on National Aviation Day, they donated the house back to the Wright family company. And they own it to this day, and I guess they do tours through the inside, but they're not open today because it's so close to Christmas. But check that out. They started it, I believe, in 1912. And Orville started living here, so he t lived here a total of 34 years. 
even though it wasn't finished till 1914, he was living in part of it while the rest of it was being finished. And uh, like I mentioned, they said that a lot of the water pump system and everything were directly made from Orville's designs. Same door, same buzzer that would have been installed. Same windows. How about that? Now we're gonna walk around the building, show a little bit more of the side. This would have been the side porch. And this was actually added to the Dayton National Registry as well as the country's National Registry. This is actually the front driveway, well the only driveway, into the property so this would have been Orville, Milton, and Catherine's entrance to the house every day. How about that? I bet they had that decorated like a Christmas tree every year. So this is the way that we would have seen them walk in. And I'm kind of surprised you don't see a National Registry plaque out here anywhere. Looks like something used to be there, as well as over here. Maybe a lion or something like that. And walking out of their front door, this is what they would have looked at. You can see the driveway circles around. All the houses that you see, those wouldn't even exist. This was all right land. Hawthorne Hill. What a beauty, huh? Just to think, if it wouldn't have been for Wilbur's untimely death in 1912, he would have lived here as well. Supposed to be a joint house for them both. That driveway is pure ice, I just slid in it. So, good idea to my grandpa. He put together the vlog today and I think he did a great job. This is the actual driveway and right there you can see the address. 901 Harmon. And from the street, this is what you would have seen driving by. It's dropped four degrees since we started driving around. Look at all the houses in this neighborhood. All of a sudden, the streets just turned to cobblestone. My, my grandpa was saying that uh, a lot of the houses out here are so beautiful and old because National Cash Register Company actually had them built because James Patterson started building here after the 1913 flood because it was on a hill. Look at that one. Wow, look at that. We actually have one more destination we're gonna hit today, it looks like. Well, here we are, our last official stop of our Dayton history tour today. This was the last home of Paul Lawrence Dunbar. And this was actually, originally, just a home that he had built in 1904 to move his mother into. It's actually, you can see here, it's the part of the Dayton Aviation Heritage Historical Park some awful people pulled off some of the 
lettering, which is unfortunate. But this house, they said that uh, he lived here after he got a divorce from his wife, Alice. He lived here for the rest of his life. He did die early at the age of 33, but he lived here with his mother until he died. He had kind of a drinking problem as well as tuberculosis. And um, man, they said online that his mother, um, what she ended up doing after he died was every year on the anniversary of his death, she would put a black wreath out here on the door as a remembrance. And it would also allow people to occasionally on his anniversary of his death and on his birth, they would allow people to come in and tour the house. And Paul Lawrence Dunbar actually got his start here in Dayton. He was born and raised here. And as I mentioned, he went to school with Orville Wright and was the class valedictorian, but he also had his first job as an elevator operator here before he got a job working for the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. He had published over 400 poems and uh, had started up the first black Dayton African-American newspaper called the Dayton Tadler, and he was only 17 years old when he did that. Unfortunately, they're closed, but we can still see the house. I tried to wipe that off, but it's pretty well iced over, but that was his mother, Matilda, and that would have been him. And as I mentioned in the vlog yesterday, she was a former slave and eventually would become the the housekeeper to the Wright family. And so when Paul would pass away, Matilda and Paul would both be buried near the Wright family plot. And you can see, I believe I said, I think he had this built in 1904 and he passed away here in February 9th, 1906. He's internationally acclaimed as America's first professional writer of African-American heritage. And over here on this fence, you can see there's a little historical landmark plaque. And that is probably an original street lamp. Once again, cobblestone streets over here. That is actually the house over there. But it looks like this is part of the museum and the entrance to the house. So I just figured I'd walk over here and show you a little bit of this. Oak and Ivy, that was his first piece of work. There you can see him speaking. Great piece of history. See, we wouldn't have been able to see it anyway because it's only open Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, unfortunately. Now let's get out of here. I figured since we were pretty close on our way to hop on the freeway, leaving the right house, it's only fitting to add Paul Lawrence Dunbar's house and I've never been here before. And look what they named the street. It used to be Summit Drive, now it's Paul Lawrence Dunbar Street. It's nice that you two were in here staying warm while I was out there working. And apparently after Paul Lawrence Dunbar died, his mother continued to live in that house until she passed away. In 1936, the city of Dayton took it over. Look at that, that's what I was talking about, a lot of houses like that. Little update, this hospital right here is Good Samaritan Hospital, and it's pretty much across the street from where Roger Troutman was shot. So this is where he would have been brought and where he would have died. And somebody sent me a message the other day and said when I was at the Solid Rock Church, the one that had the touchdown Jesus or butter Jesus, that's actually where they held his funeral service.